It is good to be together in the house of the Lord this morning. And like any good host, uh, God invites us in to his house. God beckons us to come and see that the Lord is good. And so let us hear that invitation, that call to worship from Isaiah 25, verses 6 through 9. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all people, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us trust in the Lord, the Lord who has the power to defeat death, the Lord who has promised us a rich and beautiful banquet where there will be no reason to mourn. And the Lord, who in the meantime has given us a taste of this heavenly banquet every time we gather together and every time he invites us to the table. So yes, let us trust in and praise this Lord this morning. Let us pray. God, we long for your promised future. And we thank you for your continued presence, your constant invitation get even a taste of that future. May our gathering here today be filled with the Holy Spirit. May we see a glimpse of you. God, open our eyes and our hearts. Amen. Amen. And now we're going to light the Christ candle that we light every Sunday as a reminder that Christ is our ever-gracious and ever-present host. Who will never leave us or forsake us. Brothers and sisters, let us greet one another with the peace of Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us stand and sing.
scripture reading comes from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 18 to 27. And God's word reads. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it and hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. May be seated.
pray that as your church, we might be a people who continue to seek peace in the world, that we might be a people who are known as peacemakers, that we might be a people who continue to work to bring your kingdom here on earth because it is in heaven. God, we lift up other situations such as the war that is happening in Ukraine and the devastation that is happening there. God, we just pray that you continue to equip your church in Ukraine and Poland and the various areas. That you might equip them to be your hands and your feet. That you might equip them to be ambassadors of your kingdom. That they, that they might show the love of Christ in the midst of these days. And we thank you for the ways that you are at work. And we just pray that you would continue to bring resolution to this situation. God, we lift up Linda Gray and Danny and their family today as they continue to grieve the loss of Linda's mother. God, we just pray that your comfort and your peace would continue to be with them. We ask that as their church family, we might continue to come alongside them and pray for them and encourage them and uplift them during these days. We continue to lift up Alicia and the Myers family as she continues to go through this healing process. God, we know that it's been a long process. We know that she is tired and she has endured much. We just pray that you might be her strength today. And that she might sense those words that we just sang in the depths of her soul. That because you live, she can face tomorrow, even when she does not have the strength of her own. Continue to support her family as they love and support her. Equip them in the ways that they need to be equipped in the midst of these days. We just entrust her into your loving hands. God, we continue to lift up Gigi today as she continues to recover from surgery. We thank you for a successful procedure. We just ask that you would continue to touch her body, continue to heal and restore her health. We continue to lift up all of those who are grieving. Mel and her family, Sharon Owens B and their family, the Edmonds family, the Doan family. God, we just pray that you would continue to be with all of those who are grieving today. May your presence be especially near. We also lift up our teachers and our students as they enter into these last weeks and days of school and help them to finish strong. We just ask that you would continue to, to bless them during these days. God, we are so thankful for who you are. We are thankful for the ways that you continue to be at work amongst us. We are thankful for the ways that you continue to reveal yourself to us. We are thankful for the ways that you guide and direct and bless your people. And so with one voice this morning, we pray the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. turned my microphone on so everybody can hear me that wants to hear me. Um, I, we were talking in Sunday school class, and, and one of the, the joys of, of resurrection is, I love the message of the song, I'll, I'll say it also, I'm old enough to, that was a contemporary song when I was in college, so... Um, now it's in our hymn <laughs> But I love the message, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And sometimes we get caught up, as we're talking in Sunday school class, Jesus saves us 
from the fear of death, which he does, but the power of resurrection is for every day as well. The power of resurrection gives us the power to wake up and serve him each and every day. And as we do that, we come to a point in our worship service where we worship him with our tithes and offerings. So I'm going to have two of our good-looking ushers come forward. Let's pray. Dear God, once again, thank you, thank you, thank you. You are a God who gives us abundantly pressed down, shaken together, and running over. So we come to that point where we worship you with our tithes and our offerings, and they are little praises to you. We entrust you, as we do every week, to use these gifts both here and throughout the world. Bless the gift and the giver. Bless us as we continue in worship today. Amen. Each of you 
Uh, there will be a reception immediately following the service today uh, in the gym. We would love for each one of you to join us back there, and we'll continue to celebrate our graduates a little bit further. But we wanted to make sure we cover them in prayer today. And so I'm going to ask Pastor Daniel to come and to pray for our graduates this morning. Let us pray. Lord, we are so grateful for the work that you have been doing and that you are still doing in the lives of all of our graduates. We thank you for the grace that has gone with them and has brought them to this point. And we ask that as they step into these next chapters in life, that your grace would continue to be with them, that you would continue to bless them and guide them, that they would know your love and your presence as they walk through this life. We pray that whatever may come next for all of them, they may continue to know the fellowship of your spirit and of your church, that they may continue to be strengthened by your grace, and that you may lead them to be who you have called them to be. Lord, bless them and keep them Turn your face upon them and be gracious to them. Lift up your countenance upon them and give them peace. Amen. Amen. We've got just a, a small gift for each of our graduates. more from each of them. We're going to ask them a few questions to kind of know how we can be praying better for them as we move into the reception following this. But for right now, can we please give a hand for each of our graduates? <laughs> well, thank you all. We look forward to celebrating you further in the gym. Thank you all.
Uh, we want to have a few birthdays leading up to our 75th uh, celebration, which is going to happen on July 31st. And so we want to make sure that we're getting our facilities and grounds ready to have guests in for that. And so this will be the first of a few birthdays that we're going to have. But we'll have a variety of tasks to do. So we would love it if you would be able to be up here next Saturday morning. And we will have something for everyone. Uh, but thank you for helping us be good stewards of uh, this facilities that God has blessed us with. And then finally, as I'm sure most of you know by now, but our 75th anniversary is coming up. As I mentioned, it's on July 31st, and we are going to be sending out postcards soon, uh, letting people know about that. Uh, but as you visit with people maybe that are connected to St. Paul's in the past, make sure that you're mentioning this. We want to give everyone notice that they can plan and come and attend and celebrate with us the faithfulness of God to St. Paul's over the last 75 years. So we are looking forward to that together. And now we are excited to hear the word of the Lord from Pastor Daniel this morning. Our text today comes from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. Now, before we read this passage, I think it's important to set the stage. Last week, Pastor Braddock preached on Revelation 7, and the great multitude from every people and tribe and language and nation declaring that salvation belongs to the Lamb. Now, what has happened that John has witnessed since then? It's been 13 chapters. So John has seen multiple visions of God's triumph, of the rejoicing of the saints. But he is seeing plagues poured out in the world. Locusts, water turned into blood, and many more. It is a time of chaos. Everyone suffers. No one is saved. And this is especially true for those who follow Christ. Because in the meantime, since the last Writing from last week, John has seen the rise of a dragon and of two beasts who have come to make war against those who follow the land. These beasts that represent the Roman Empire and the state worship of the emperor are making war. They are trying to destroy the followers of Christ. But these visions of plagues and of beasts are not really new for John's audience. They are in many ways reminders of what the churches that he was writing to already knew. John wrote to churches that knew the ever-present realities of a hostile empire. John had been exiled. Many had died at the hands of that empire. Chaos and death, pain and sorrow were not strangers, but were very near. So near they were often overwhelming. And it is in this context that John receives and then shares the vision from our text today. So with that in mind, hear now the word of the Lord from Revelation 21, verses 1 through 6. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them. They will be God's peoples. And God will be with them and be their God. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne see, said, See, I am making all things new. Also God said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then God said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. To John and to these churches that are surrounded by chaos and death comes this beautiful vision of hope. 
a vision of what will finally happen when the God who was and who is and who is to come finally comes in all of God's fullness. A vision of the new creation, of the new heavens and the new earth, of the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven as a bride adorned for a husband, and a vision of God dwelling in the midst of human beings. The very God who created all the world will now tabernacle with God's people. Never again will God's people be alone or feel alone or abandoned. Never again will empire threaten God's people. God will be with them close enough to wipe the tears from their eyes. The separation caused by humanity's fall in the garden is undone. And now God lives in intimate relationship with humanity once more. Humanity and all of creation is made new by the presence of God in their midst. No more will creation groan as it waits with eager expectation for the revelation of the children of God, as we read in Romans. The children of God will be revealed by the unmistakable presence of God in their midst and will be liberated from futility and decay. And God's glory, revealed by all of this to be a glory not of victory or the destruction of enemies, but a glory of restoration, redemption, and recreation. It is a glory that comes not from what is destroyed, but from what is made new. And it is in this glory that the people of God share in this new creation. This beautiful, glorious vision of God in which we will all share when our bodies are redeemed in God's own creation. It is a vision of hope, a vision that inspires us to keep on moving. But sometimes this vision can tempt us, can tempt me, to just let things be as they are. To say that if this is what God will bring about, then all I have to do is to sit and to wait. See, sometimes it even seems like the groaning of creation is too loud, too large for me to do anything about. So why bother? Sometimes I can feel the weight of the chaos and the decay and the death in the world around me, and I am tempted to give up and to wait for God to act, to bring about God's new creation that he has promised in this vision. But this vision, within the larger context of Revelation, does not offer us this option. It does not give us the choice to sit and to wait, but rather it calls us and prods us into action. Because this vision does not simply have future promises. God does not say either I will make all things new or I will make all new things all new things. No, God says, I am, I am making all things new. In the midst of this world filled with chaos and death, God declares that even now God is working to bring restoration. And in the midst of the world run by empire and this beast, God declares that even now God is working to bring the redemption of humanity. So to a people surrounded by chaos and death, a people who are constantly harassed by an empire that seems to rule the world, God does not say, just wait and I will make everything better. No, God says, even now, in the midst of the chaos and of the death, in the midst of the empire, I am working to bring redemption and restoration. So do not give up, but join me. It is a call to action, a call to join in this redeeming and restoring work of God, a call to join with the one who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, a call to witness to this God, the one who was and who is and who is to come. It is a reminder that not only has God been faithful from the first day of creation until now, but that God can be trusted to be faithful to continue to act for the restoration and redemption of the world. And that God can be trusted to one day come in all of God's fullness, bringing new creation. And so God calls God's people to join in this work of making all things new to begin it by being made new themselves. But this is also not a quick fix. God's promise of redemption and restoration and of this new creation does not mean that we, as God's people, do not face chaos and death, pain and sorrow. This is no get out of jail free card. 
No, it is an invitation to join in God's redeeming work, knowing that it might indeed and probably will lead to further hardship, especially in their context. It is an invitation to follow the Lamb who stands as though it was slain in a world that seems that it is ruled by beasts. It is an invitation to a hard work of justice and peace in a world where violence and injustice so often seem to have the last say. And so the call to be able to join in God's work comes not on its own, but within this promise of hope. Within the promise of the hope that God will one day restore and redeem all of creation. Within the hope that one day their very bodies will be redeemed by God's new creation act of resurrection. It is the hope of that one day death and sorrow, crying and pain will be no more. The hope that one day in God's new creation the sea itself will be no more. See the sea, the sea was the embodiment, the symbol of chaos. The sea was the place from which the first beast of empire arose in Revelation. The sea was untamable, uncontrollable. It was a symbol of chaos that was beyond any human control or action. And in this new creation, the sea itself, this chaos, will be no more. So God promises that one day God's people will never again live in a world where death and chaos and empire are present realities. And my brothers and sisters, we too know what it means to live in a world where death and sorrow are ever present. Random shootings kill 10 people. And we wonder why. We lose brothers and sisters to illness and disease. And we wonder why. We know chaos. Our world has been upside, turned upside down by a pandemic over the last few years. And we know in the midst of this chaos and death, what it is like to wonder if things will ever get better. And so we can wonder, is there any point in continuing this, to continuing to be God's faithful people, to witness to God's redeeming work in the world? But in the midst of this chaos comes the resounding cry of Revela from Revelation, one day there will be no more death. One day there will be no more pain. One day there will be no more sorrow or crying. One day all of the chaos of this world will be no more. And instead of this death and sorrow and crying and pain and chaos, there will be the presence of God wiping the tears from our eyes and dwelling in our midst. One day God will finish what God has started in making all things new. And when what God does, it will be beyond anything we can imagine. One day, all of creation will be liberated from its bondage to dead and decay. And one day, we too will stand in the very presence of God and celebrate that death and sorrow and crying and pain are no more. Praise God. This has been what Revelation has been declaring all along. Chaos and death and empire may seem to rule the world, but this is still God's world. God will still have the final say. And so Revelation calls us to sing unto the Lord a new song. Not because chaos and death are no more now, but because even in the midst of the chaos and the death, God is at work. And one day, God's reign will be fully realized. And on that day, death and chaos will be no more. And so, my brothers and sisters, we are called to join in the worship of the God who was and who is and who is to come. To join in praising the one who is seated on the Lamb at, on the throne as we sing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Amen. And we celebrate the good news of God's victory over sin and grave as we sing, Jesus has overcome and the grave is overwhelmed. The victory is won. He is risen from the dead. Amen. And today, as we look forward to the future, we know that because Jesus lives, there is indeed hope that, the de that death and chaos will one day be no more. And so we can face tomorrow and fear no longer has the final word. That's right. But I think one of the best 
saw in summaries of Revelation, in, especially in this passage, is found in the hymn, This Is My Father's Book. In the midst of this hymn celebrating God's good creation and the ways as that creation joins in the praise of God comes this verse, these lines. This is my father's world. Oh, let me never forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. Yes. Yes. This is what Revelation has been declaring all along. In the midst of the chaos and death, this is still God's world, and in the end, God will redeem and restore all of creation. And so we are called to live as the redeemed people of God, to join in the war of God's work of making all things new, even in the midst of the death and the chaos. We are called to witness what God has done and what God will do, to sing loud the praises of the one who was and who is and who is to come. We are called to live now as a people of hope, who know that chaos and death will not have the last word, but that one day they will be no more. My friends, this is not an easy task. When chaos and death surround us as they always do, they can become overwhelming. Hope can seem far away. And so in the midst of our grief and our sorrow, we believe we can believe that there is no more reason for hope. And so we need constant reminders of God's faithfulness and of God's hope that is ours in Christ Jesus. This is why we gather in this space every week, to encourage one another and to be encountered by the God who was and who is and who is to come, and to be formed as a people of resurrection and hope in the midst of the death and the chaos. This is why we come to the table. At this table, God invites us to remember anew the death and the resurrection of Christ, and thus to receive anew the hope of God's new creation. In Christ's death and resurrection, God has swallowed up death. And so we have in this meal a foretaste of that heavenly banquet, the wedding supper of the Lamb, the feast of rich foods from Isaiah. At this table, we proclaim that the lamb that was slain is risen and will come again. And that when he does, all of creation will be redeemed and restored, and that God will dwell with humanity in all of God's fullness. At this table, we are once again called out of the ways of chaos and death and into the ways of the God who is making all things new. Here at this table, we receive the grace of God that we need to live as a people of resurrection and hope, a people who join in the God's work of redemption and restoration. And so we come to this table, not of our own strength or of our own will, but as a people in need of God's grace and God's hope. And here we discover that Christ's invitation to the hungry and the thirsty is extended to us. This invitation is not determined by fitness or by church membership. Instead, we believe that Christ's table is open to all who recognize the need of God's grace, who earnestly repent in the, of their sins and desire to live in peace with God and with one another. And so, as we come to this table, let us confess together our sin by carrying the prayer of confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, in what we have done and in what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we might delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Church, by the grace and the love of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, we are the forgiven and freed people of God. Thanks be to God. And so we come to this table, and as we come, we remember. We remember how on the night that Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, 
He gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these Yasmani acts in Christ Jesus, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union for Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Church, in just a moment, when you are ready, I'm going to invite you to come forward to receive these good gifts of God at the table. And when we come to the table, this is not just an act of, remem uh, uh, of us remembering what God has done. At this table, we are encountered anew by the God who is making all things new. And we are given the hope and the courage to join in that work. Here, we are given the sustaining grace of God so that we might live as God's redeemed people in a world full of chaos and death. It is not by our own strength or merit that we are invited to this table, but by the grace of God. And so as you come forward to receive the elements, can please come down the center aisle with empty hands held up, ready to receive the elements, not grasping for what we can get on our own, but accepting the freely given good gifts of God. Once you have received these elements, please return to your seats and we will all partake together. My dear brothers and sisters, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, taste, and see that the Lord is good.
eat in remembrance of his sacrifice and be grateful. Now please pull back the second layer to receive to, to reveal the juice. Church, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Drink in remembrance of his holy sacrifice and be grateful. And so together, as God's holy people, we say, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit, give ourselves for others in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Church, if you're able, please stand to receive this morning's benediction. May the one who is the Alpha and the Omega continue to bring in us that new creation, that we might give him glory in all times and in all places, even in the midst of the chaos and the death. Let us go singing his praise together.